Hey, everybody. Welcome back today to Retro Tech. I have a familiar PVM, and that's a Sony PVM 14M2 that we'll be covering in today's video. Now, this video is going to go and cover all the way from when you may get this PVM for the first time. Let's say you buy it or you come into a chance to maybe get one and you want to take a look at the PVM ahead of time, or maybe you got a great deal on one and you wanted to see what it might need for refurbishment, if anything. Well, today's video is going to be really good for that. It's a long video, and I've broken it down into segments. So if you want to come back, or if there's something in particular you are looking for, definitely check the description of the video, because I have time marked each specific chapter, because I'm going to go through everything in this video today. We're going to start with kind of the first initial unboxing a little bit of the monitor. Now, I'm not going to actually show you an unboxing portion in this video. What I will do is in the introduction here, I'll show you some pictures while I'm talking because this was one of the worst pack jobs that I've seen probably in the last six months where a monitor has not been destroyed. The box was all disintegrated up. There was very little actual bubble packaging, and the seller actually used a lot of just really uh, cheap paper to wrap the PVM around and around and around. And somehow it survived that trip, uh, even though the box pretty much blew up into three or four pieces right after I moved it off my porch inside. And so once I got it out of the box, I went through and I did some initial checks on it. You'll see those. You'll see what it looks like before I do any kind of adjustments. You know, I did some convergence checks on it so you can see what it looks like through a professional convergence tool that I used on here to check that out. I've also gone through and I've done some recommended uh, upgrades and maintenance from Sony where they have had actually a fault designed in this PVM unintentionally, but there is a fault in there with the red, green, and blue line and the vertical blanking. And you'll see more of that in the video to come. And then also we're gonna get and clean it thoroughly, calibrate it for geometry, do one final screen check. And then I've actually got some uh, physical body work that I'm going to be doing on the shell too. So just a full packed video. Uh, so if you really enjoy PVMs, you could stay around and just watch the restoration. Or if you're thinking about getting a PVM, this might be a good video for you. Just note that this model is one of the more common PVMs there are. And most of the PVMs that you find, uh, a good majority of them, 75% of them will be nearly the same kind of build out as today's 14M2. And also just because something is a 20 inch monitor, it's just pretty much an, a little bit larger size scaled version of the 14 inch monitor. All the parts internally are nearly the same and it's always the same process. So if you have a slightly different monitor than the PVM 14M2, you still may be able to be or you still might be able to learn something that may be valuable to you when keeping your PVM up to date and servicing it routinely. So without any more introduction today, let's go ahead now and switch over. We're going to look at the 14M2U and today's repair video. All right, here we've got the Sony PVM unpacked and powered on. I've let it warm up a little bit, so obviously it arrived fine, even though the packing was really subpar in my opinion and just to show you some of the outside exterior before we really get into the uh, internal hardware servicing you want to take a quick look at some of the buttons on the configuration down here and besides just your power on button and a lot of your knobs that you have on your m2 model which are quick adjustments um, you can use a lot of these adjustments just remember that some of them are not used in RGB mode, but in most other video input modes they will be usable. Now if I move on to this other area of the button board down here, this is an important area where you will make other adjustments or change input settings to whichever video input you need, and then you can do combination things or change immediate settings like underscan, 16 by 9 mode on the screen, there's also a degauss button. Mm that when you press it it's supposed to help degauss the tube in case any magnetism has affected your picture quality and then you've got a mesh area over here which has your mono speaker housed behind it 
So this actual monitor itself is in pretty good shape. There is a little bit of minor scuffing and scratching up here to the top area of the bezel. And thankfully all the parts as far as buttons and the U-bolts did not get damaged at all in the shipping and packing process. Now there is something on the side here that was in the listing. If we look at the side of the PVM we have a small ding or dent on the grate where something has hit the side of the shell. Now it's not impacted the PVM's performance in any way but I told the owner that I would just take a hammer and kind of flatten that out. So we'll do that on this shell. We'll also clean the entire shell off because there is some grime and what appears to be leftover adhesive. Some minor scratching along it. And then if we look at this side, it actually looks rather clean. No dings or anything, just needs a little bit of cleaning. And then the back side has, that has quite a few scuffs that are going to be more visible and will not be really able to get rid of them. But we will clean it still and then we'll come back and reassemble all this after we do our full servicing. But that's just a look at the outside of the shell. So we're going to look at the 240p test suite now and see if we can pull up some geometry settings that we could see what we're starting with on a screen. What I'm initially going to do here is pull up test patterns so we can see our starting point on this monitor. I'll start with our color bars and you can turn your brightness up and what you're really trying to see is if your tube does produce this three line gray pattern in here. It should on a 600 line tube. Sometimes if you have a lower line tube or if your tubes bloomed out or bleeding out or old and worn out when you pull this up you'll get a lot of distortion on your screen so that's why you want to pull this up and you can check to see that that is on there and then the way you're supposed to calibrate this is to have it where that is just barely visible on the screen at all barely visible kind of like that on your screen where you barely see those three blocks rectangles within the square the next pattern we're going to look at is our grid for our geometry the first one available 256 by 224 and from initial looks we're not in bad shape but what we need to do is decrease or get our vertical centerness down some and then our pin cushion settings are actually pretty good uh, but we also need to do a horizontal adjustment I'm doing a visible check here for linearity, but not just linearity, also convergence. And the linearity pattern is really good about showing uh, any convergence problems that you may have in each corner because you'll see color separation where your whites might show red, blue, uh, generally speaking. You'll see it on one side or the other. Let's do a proper check of the convergence real quick. And I've got this Klein convergence tool. Now maybe there's some kind of lens you can use on your phone to do this but what I've got is an actual old tool made by Klein that will go in here and actually check the convergence if you just softly place it against the screen and if we actually look inside here and so if you try to focus on the beam which is inside the lens that you're looking into you can see where the blue it's got three lenses in there and it just separates the white out into only allowing the blue on the right side, the green in the center, and then ultimately the red on the right, which I'm not able to pick up. There's the red on the right. And what you're looking for is beam uniformity. So you want to make sure that vertically each one of those colors is pretty uniform and that way you've got nice convergence for all three colors into a single beam for white and it really can sharpen up your picture especially in the corners one of the other good things to check out is a scroll test so there is a regular scroll test that is quite popular that is the sonic background and you could just use that to make sure that as your screen displays a good 240p image and it goes across the screen that you don't have any tearing 
or warping due to a linearity problem, which again, I have not seen any kind of linearity problem really on this tube. So that's, again, really good sign that it's probably low hours. So now that we've got a good overview of what's going on mechanically with this, the rest of the checks are going to require me to remove the shell, but that's okay because I need to clean it up. And there are some components that I'm going to pull from the circuit board inside here that are recommended by Sony. And it's very important to maybe either check these two components or just go ahead and be prepared to replace them. They're quite cheap. So we're going to go ahead now, but we got to, again, get the shell off to move any further in this uh, check. Now that the screws are removed, we can slide the sh shell back, get it out of the way. This is a first inspection back here, so I want you to just take a look at the footage here of the inside of the monitor. You'll be able to see a lot of just dust built up on some components, and over time that does happen, and what that can do is it can stack up on some of these components that are actually generating heat and then that dust will act as an insulation on top of these components and so it traps the heat internally in the component and then that causes the temperature to go up and ultimately can cause things like electrolytic capacitors to fail or wear out quicker than they should now this is not a lot of dust, but it's a good example of one that has never been probably serviced at or looked at inside before. Before I get into the full disassembly of this, I want to show you another test I'd like to perform on the power supply, which is over here on the other side. Again, here's the power supply. The first thing I'm going to do is remove the two screws. So let's lift up a little bit and go ahead and lean this power supply over and to relieve some pressure be doing that and releasing these cable holds to give a little bit more space here same thing over here and then all along this back shielding And then I'm going to simply disconnect the top portion up here, this plug cable from its connector, the ground cable also. All right, so let's have a little discussion here about the power supply. This power supply works like this. You feed your AC current into the back of the PVM where you install your standard power cable right here next to your input board. And that power then goes directly into this power supply. And then the power supply converts that into the usable power for the PVM. Now, what's going on up here where we're leaving it connected, we're leaving just the degaussing cable and the actual power switch, which this feeds over straight into the power switch on the front of the PVM, so that when we press that power button, it tells the power supply to turn on. Now normally how this functions is that power is generated, and then properly uh, the current is tuned, and then it's sent out this connection where it goes into the main board, and then it's sent around and all the other uh, processes it, it goes through to give you a picture on the screen. I'll show you the connector here, but you're looking at from the far right hand side over here next to this little electrolytic capacitor. You've got a isolated pin that's for 5 volts. Next to that you've got a 15 volt negative pin, and then we've got a ground pin right here, kind of in the center. Next to that is 115 volts, another ground pin, and then a positive or just regular 15 volt. 15 volts obviously are higher voltage and then the 5 voltage 
is our lower voltage, but that's going to be DC current. So what we can do is we can get a multimeter and test the DC voltage as we turn the power supply on by plugging it in. And, and so let's go ahead and do that real quick. We'll do this correctly. First off, we'll check the very first rail, and that is 5 volts. Should be DC, so we're going to go red to that pin. And then I like to use this ground right here. And if you look at my meter, it says right at 5.00 volts DC current. So that's perfect. Okay, let's check our positive 15 volts. Well, that's good. That's right at 15 and a half. That's definitely within tolerance. So I've gone ahead and powered it back off. And before I go and do any more testing, I'm just going to reconnect. Again, it is turned off. I'm going to reconnect this to the main monitor. And we'll see, make sure that the screen still functions properly after our testing. Let's power it. Then we still got our screen power up. And we'll just check our menus real quick. So our menu's there. Everything's fine. So now we're going to jump into the servicing of the rest of the monitor, which means we'll tear it apart and service the main board. The last thing I need to do before I remove this board is to discharge the tube. Now please note that this can be a dangerous process. Now on this Sony PVM, there's actually fail safes involved, so it's supposed to dissipate all the current even before you discharge it. But that doesn't always work, it doesn't always happen. The way I'm discharging it right now is according to the Sony manual, and the reason they ask you to do it like this without the tool to start with is to prevent damage to your anode cap and well your anode cap here and the point where your tube is on the back here so you don't scratch it with your probe or whatever tool you're going to use to discharge now it's di it's not discharged yet so what we're going to do is we're going to tap those two prongs under this anode cap against the frame make sure you're not touching the metal frame and if you hear a zap or anything that's per that means you're discharged if you hear nothing then that means it's already been discharged most likely and the current was out before you even took it apart so that's just how Sony says to discharge it and then if you're concerned you can come in with your discharge tool and discharge that point against your frame also and just make a current path and honestly if you've got a, a screwdriver that you could do it with you could even do it like that and bridge those two points. We're not really doing anything to the back of the anode here except cleaning around it so we don't need to worry about that as much but that's how Sony asks the technicians to discharge a tube. Now we can take a closer look at this board and also with it completely torn apart like this it'll be easier to clean and get a lot of that build up dust especially off this area and then off the boards individually. So here are the three secondary boards that are 
inside the monitor. First off down here we have our C board, which is our neck board. And the most important thing we're going to do here is pretty much just clean this. Just a little bit of dusting. And what you can check on here is for cold solder joints. It doesn't always happen, but it is possible. Most common areas that might develop those are going to be around these little um, regulators here. And the only reason I mention that is because the temperature can get higher in this area than other areas on this board. And then you can always check around your actual connection points. You're going into your tube. But for the most part, this board looks very clean and uh, definitely no signs of any kind of damage or even real signs of overheating. Sometimes when you get these boards out, you'll see a lot of discoloration on some areas, like I said, especially around these heat sinks and then these larger resistors right here. They'll generate so much heat that you'll get burns on the circuit board. So just note that that does typically happen. So that's a good sign that there aren't a huge amount of hours in or on this monitor and uh, it just needs to be a little bit cleaned. The next board we'll look at real quickly is our input board which uh, just pops out and this is pretty standard stuff for all the M2 series. Um, this board really does never or doesn't really ever have any troubles in it and I've never had to service this particular board for any reason. There's not a lot of heat generated at all on this board and so thankfully it's a pretty easy one to just clean and move on from. And then this is the power supply. Now there is shielding in place so we'll need to remove the shielding to accurately look inside here and then clean it properly. But it's pretty much the same power supply for this M series. Uh, it'll be the same for the M2 or the M4. And it could also be one of the medical units. So for example, the MDUs or even the Olympus PVMs all use the same power supply for the most part and sometimes there are slight variations of the build out on the power supply however and at the end of the day it's still designed to put out that specific voltage out of this output so if if it's compatible and it's outputting the proper voltage even if the build out is slightly different on yours than this one it's still probably safe to use on your monitor. Now, I've discussed a lot with Save on Pat about the capacitors in here, and he tells me that this power supply was so well designed that the capacitors do not tend to fail. And I've not had many where they have actually failed, I don't know, on this specific monitor. But if you don't have a power, you know, you can do the test we did, and if you have some kind of power issue, you can either come back and check the caps on each line, you know, that'll be in the service manual. Or what more often than not happens, that Pat told me, is any of these ICs on this board can short out and go bad. And you can see on this board there's just loads of ICs, almost as many, half as many ICs as there are capacitors. And the problem is, is those are very difficult to get replacement parts for on these. A lot of them uh, you have to outsource and look to eBay and it's like $15.00 per chip. Anyway, that's this power supply. It just needs to be clean and then uh, we can move on to the larger and more important main chassis. Alright, so here's a first look at our main board and you know you could go crazy and recap this entire board but 99% of the time that is not going to be uh, beneficial really. Not an entire recap unless there's an issue that you just can't figure out and you want to recap it because there's a lot of little spots in here and it's difficult to recap this without ultimately, you know, if you don't have a lot of experience, you could damage a trace on something and render your monitor useless. But the most important capacitors on something like this where it's still functioning yet uh, needs to be kind of checked on preventive maintenance are some caps over in this area next to this heat sink. And I've done a video in the past where these specific caps control vertical blanking and could cause the red, green, and blue lines to drift into your screen. And that's actually a design flaw by Sony on the capacitors that came in this chassis standard. Now it doesn't always fail, but it's definitely something that came out in a service bulletin 
and that we need to make sure that we service and you know preventatively maintain this by changing at least those two capacitors this is our flyback transformer over here so um, that's an important part and then let's see some other important parts this is our hot is what they like to call it and it's just our horizontal out uh, trans transformer I think or anyway that's called the hot right there that I see the capacitors I'll show you which ones exactly we're going to remove it's actually this capacitor right here and this one right next to it on the other side of the heat sink that's capacitors 572 and 584 let's go ahead and do that just by Here's those two capacitors. 584 is originally a 1 microfarad 160 volt and the next one is a 164.7 microfarad. So let's uh, let's see what we're going to use to replace these two and we'll also test and see what the microfarad readings are on these two capacitors. All right, here's my replacement caps. First off, they are both 105 C or Celsius temperature rated, which is important. Now, the first one that is the 160 volt slash 4.7 microfarad, I'm going to increase that to a 10 microfarad. I'm going to maintain the 160 volts, but I'm going to go up on the microfarad on there, and that is acceptable according to the Sony. Uh, service bulletin. I'm sorry that I don't have that service bulletin available. I just remember that from another video I made. And if you want to see those videos, I'll link to them in the description here. And then I'm going to upgrade this second cap that was in C572, which is a 160 microfarad by or 160 volt, excuse me, by 1 microfarad. And I'm going to increase that to 250 volt and 1 microfarad. These are Nishikon caps, high performance just look at how much size this capacitor is compared to that and this one's supposed to be higher quality better rated and just look how much longer like sh different in size this one's pretty similar it's just obviously been shortened a lot so that's that's actually um, encouraging but that one's a lot smaller than the one that's come out so uh, we'll do that let's also test these capacitors to see what they look like Caps have been reinstalled now. These are two new capacitors. All right, let's go ahead now and hook up this first capacitor, which is just one microfarad. I've calibrated my prongs, and I should be able to put that in there. Nanofarads. Let's go and do frequency. One hundred and twenty hertz. So when you look in here, nine eighty-three nanofarads. I believe that should mean that's like 0.983 microfarads. So that's actually within tolerance. Let's check the other one. This one should be four point seven. So we got three point six, four point seven to three point six. So this one is wearing down. We're definitely past 20 to 25 percent on our uh, cap. So this is this cap right here, which is the one. What was the one on the inside? 4.7. It's actually starting to go down and fail. So, you know, it could have been another year. It could have been another month. It could have been another three years. But eventually, this would get to a point where it would probably wear down even more 
and at that point it would show the red, green, and blue lines on the screen and you'd overcorrect and eventually this would just pass or fail and then you know it could cause more trouble down the line. put back together and we're going to do an initial power up so I'm just plugging in my AC power right now all right everything looks normal on here as the menus pulled up now we're going to need to get in here and calibrate before I do that I want to show you on this blank screen how to get into the sub menu start from your main screen here press menu you'll pull up your main menu and then you press the degauss and enter simultaneously and it pulls up your sub menu. And to move through sub menu you just use the menu and the enter button to go up and down and you can see here for example this is our vertical center here's our setting it's number seven you can go up and down on that but we'll do that while we're calibrating and what we're gonna do today is we're gonna really be concentrating on settings number 17 and down 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, number 5, and that should be just about it for the ones we're concerned with. You make an adjustment to the number by pressing either up or down. Just some tips this little indicator, it will show what the current setting that is saved is. So right now it's saved at 15. If I go to 10 or 11 and I'm playing with it like I can't remember what it was, well, as I scroll through back and up and down, it will tell me by putting that marker there. Another thing is, is this will not save the settings or any changes I do until I press degauss once and it says right, and then I got to press degauss again and it will say right again, and you will get that little asterisk that must show, and that means you have written the changes in the settings to the menu and now from now on it will um, power on it will start up now if you get in here and again you don't remember what your setting is or you don't like your setting and you want to reset you can always power the monitor off and then power it back on and none of your settings will be saved it'll go back to the last default save also you can pull out of the menu the sub menu that is and then just press degauss and it should go back to uh, men, it should kick you out of basically the sub menu and then go all the way back to the original settings but just to be safe you can always just power it off and then power it back on alright so we're gonna go ahead and start now calibrating this screen for geometry the color looks good enough at least to the eye so that you can use the built-in color palettes there are multiple different color temperatures another thing you want to consider is not to close your uh, PVM up or put the shell back on until after you finish your calibration because if you have an issue where you have a screen tilt or any kind of convergence that you're going to want to correct you'll have to do that from behind the monitor even if you power it off make the adjustment and then power it on to see how it went you'll still have to do all that from uh, the back side of the monitor with the shell off and then if you have the rest of that set though and you're very confident already in the screen tilt and the convergence then you can put your shell on and calibrate after that and that's just going to affect you know the horizontal and vertical geometry and then the corners and sides and the linearity
one of the last things that we're going to work on on the outside is this little ding here. It's definitely easier to see from the inside. If you can see how it's bumped and bezeled out. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit it on my rug and I'm going to just use a little hammer and tamp it down a little bit to flatten it out. And I'm going to put a second shirt folded over kind of rag and put that in between the hammer and the metal that way I don't directly hit it with the hammer and cause any spot right in here now it's pretty large that divot originally and it affected this whole area and that center point was just pushed in pretty far pretty minor at this point and I don't know that me really using the hammer on it will help it any it does kind of move a little bit so if you had some more malleable tools you might and I want, to I want to secure this neck board right here in a place with putting some, just this product right here, black RTV silicone. And it's not going to take much. And it's removable too. So if you need to come in here and do another service job, you know, in five, ten years, it's very easy to cut through this and just pull it all off yet it will maintain a good bond there and hold that uh, neck board in place on the CRT itself like it did before from the factory. This can also be used to secure things up around the deflection yoke too if you need to put in say a convergence strip or uh, a magnet or something if you need to add anything you can add this to the back of the tube it won't hurt it and it's definitely better than like using a tape or any other kind of adhesive that could permanently bond the last thing to do is to put the shell back on You always want to check your screen after you put the shell on. Sometimes you'll have some weird interference that you may not have been able to see before you had the shell while it was still off. Just test another game out and see if uh, how it looks. So at the end of the day, this is a pretty nice PVM. It's been checked out. I feel confident that you should be able to get plenty of years of usage off it, especially for retro gaming. And what I mean by that is you should easily get 3,000 hours of usage on this without any real need for another adjustment. Well, thanks again for watching today. I am Steve with RetroTech. I sincerely appreciate all your questions and comments, so please leave those below, and I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.